My name is Moet Meth. I'm the Assistant Director for the Center for Asian American Studies, the only center in the state of Texas where a degree in Asian American Studies is offered, and the oldest in the U.S. South from 1999. It's such a distinct pleasure to invite and have here Dr. Koramatsu, the Executive Director of the Fred T. Koramatsu Institute. Um, it's been a very busy travel week for her, of course, since January 30th is celebrated in cities and states across the nation as Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties of the Constitution, including here in Austin, where we just passed a proclamation to the City Council yesterday. Eighty years ago, in 1944, the Supreme, Supreme Court issued its ruling on Korematsu versus the United States, deciding that Korematsu, alongside 120,000 other Japanese Americans, were, uh, uh, were incarcerated during World War II. Two years earlier, Fred Korematsu had refused and was arrested. Represented by the ACLU, Korematsu was convicted of disobeying military orders, given five years probation, and sent to Topaz incarceration center in Utah. The U.S. Court of Appeals agreed with the lower court's orders, and the case was heard all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, where the majority decision declared that Korematsu's incarceration was justified by quote-unquote military necessity. The case was reopened in 1983, and Korematsu's conviction was overturned, but Korematsu versus the United States continues to be court precedent. We're extremely lucky to be here in the company of Dr. Korematsu and learn from her about the legacy of her father and her continued work with the Fred T. Korematsu Institute. We have a mixed audience today of law school students, undergraduates, and graduate students, staff, uh, faculty, and staff. In a moment, I will invite Apurva Gunturu and Michelle Wen, both UT Law students, to introduce Dr. Korematsu more formally, and Professor Arnold Jin, Assistant Professor of Instruction and former lawyer with several, several different projects, including the ACLU. Before I do this, I want to give a quick round of thanks to the William Wayne Justice Center for Public Interest Law, the Bernard and Audrey Rappaport Center for Human Rights, and the Sissy Berenthold Fund for Peace and Social Justice, as well as, as, well as to Professor Denise Gilman, the Korematsu Institute board member, and you. Thanks also to uh, UT alumni Michael Chang in, at 600 Degrees Pizzeria and Draft House out in Ram Rock, so the pizza made it hot and fresh in 20 minutes. <laughs> to UT campus. We'll have some time for Q&A. You have a QR code that's available here on the screen behind you, as well as the, the, the flyer that was handed to you on the way in. Please use it to ask Dr. Boromatsu any questions. Thank you so much. My name is Apurva. This is my fellow law student, Michelle, and we're honored to introduce Dr. Korematsu today. And she has a long and illustrious oh, biography, so I will have to read, read that. <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> um, Dr. Korematsu is the founder and executive director of the Fred T. Korematsu Institute, and she is the daughter of the late civil rights icon Fred Korematsu. Um, Karen is a national speaker and travels the country advocating for civil liberties, social justice, civics, and ethnic studies education. She encourages COVID-19 vaccinations in AAPI communities and promotes Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and the Constitution on January 30th in perpetuity in all 50 states. Dr. Korematsu has been interviewed on radio, podcasts, and TV. Her op-eds have appeared in the New York Times and Washington Post. She has received numerous awards and honors, including the ACLU Chief Justice Earl Warren Civil Liberties Award, the GMNY 2015 Isidore Star Award, the Napaba President's Award, the Muslim Advocates Voice of Freedom Award, and the Asian Pacific American Institute for Congressional Studies Community Leadership Award. In addition, she is also a recipient to the key um, to the city of Dearborn, Michigan by the mayor of Dearborn in 2017. Karen is a member of the National Council for Social Studies and an honored member of the Council of Social, State Social Studies Specialists. Karen is the first non-lawyer member of the National Asian Pacific American Bar Association, or NAPABA, and she serves on the board of directors on Asian Americans Advancing Justice, AAJC, um, DC and the NAPABA Law Foundation, and she serves on the National Advisory Board of the Fred T. Korematsu Center for Law and Equality at the Seattle University School of Law. So she's quite busy. Karen <laughs> has signed on to various amicus briefs opposing violations of constitutional rights. Um, in June of 2021, Dr. Korematsu was appointed to serve as the California Education Ambassador by the State Superintendent, Tony Thurmond. Karen received her first honorary doctorate of humane letters from St. Michael's College in Burlington, Vermont in May 2019 
and she received her second honorary doctorate, doctorate of Humane Letters from Haverford College in Pennsylvania in May 2022. So we are very honored to have her speak to us today. Um, and I'll be introducing Arnold Jin, Professor Arnold Jin. He graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a BA in English and Asian American Studies. His JD is from Gonzaga University School of Law, and he also holds an LLM in Intellectual Property Law and Policy from the University of Washington School of Law. He began his legal career as a civil rights attorney with the ACLU of Washington, where he managed the government surveillance project, which focused on the intersection of race, privacy, technology, and the warrantless surveillance of domestic citizens. As a litigator in private practice, Arnold handled an assortment of cases ranging from domestic relations, con law, criminal defense, consumer protection, intellectual property, and highly complex commercial litigation. Currently, he serves as general counsel at Minamoto Foods, a seafood and Japanese alcohol distribution company here in Austin, and he's also an assistant professor of instruction for the Center of Asian American Studies, where he teaches courses on Asian American history, identity, and jurisprudence. In addition to this, um, to still being a cooperating attorney at the ACLU, he also volunteers his time with endometriosis. Oh my gosh. Endometriosis. <laughs> Foundation <laughs> of Houston and raises guide puppies for Southeastern guide dogs. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aprua and Michelle, for that lovely introduction. I, I just wanted to first say, Dr. Korbatz, it is a tremendous honor and I'm incredibly humbled to be here uh, sitting next to you as someone who teaches Asian American history. I'm looking around the room and I see that there are a number of my students here in undergrad and some that are currently in my history class and I think the level of knowledge that people are aware of beyond kind of what kind of Rohit stated, um, do you mind maybe first sharing a little bit about your father and maybe some of the actions that kind of led to his activism and his bravery? Well, thank you, Professor. Um, hello, Austin, uh, and uh, happy Fred Cormatsu Day of Civil Abuse in the Constitution. Uh, I am excited to be here, and I can tell you, I've been here before, but this trip has just been awesome. And uh, we have some great elected officials uh, that are, are trying to do the right thing, and, and I think in the face of adversity in themselves. Um, and we hope uh, that a legislative bill is going to be uh, introduced. Um, we've contacted uh, Representative uh, Jean Wu and, uh, for a Fred Cormont today of civil liberties and constitution for the state of Texas. Um, so that would be exciting and as they say, I'll be back. <laughs> uh, and uh, I don't believe that my father ever uh, spoke here in, in Texas. I, I, he always wanted to speak, you know, in the South. Um, it was always the Northwest, uh, that, or Northeast, I should say, that he was invited to, I mean, obviously the West Coast. Uh, but, you know, his, his story is an American story. It's, it's not just a Japanese-American story or a Japanese-American incarceration story or a West Coast story. It's an American story, and I emphasize that because that's how my father believed in this country. He learned about the Constitution in high school, so especially for high school students, I tell them, pay attention, because he thought he had rights as an American citizen and was, was clearly upset when he learned that he didn't because you know, all due process of law was denied. And what ha happened to equal protection under the law? Uh, it, it was, you know, 1942, of course, um, and when the executive order was, was issued, and he lived in, in the Bay Area, uh, in, in what they call a little town called San Leandro, and, and Oakland's next to it. Uh, and he um, actually had work, been working um, in the shipyards. Now, you know, before, some of you may not know, but before the war, before World War II, uh, or before the bombing of Pearl Harbor even, there was talk of the draft. My father and his three Caucasian friends wanted to enlist together so they could stay together. Um, they didn't want to do anything major like the Army or Navy, but you know, they tried to, uh, you know, first started with um, uh, the, uh, the Coast Guard. And back in those days, when you, when you signed up for the military, you went to the post office. And uh, you, uh, they, um, they went to the post office and they had these long tables, end to end, and, uh, and you had the, the, you know, the Coast Guard, National Guard, etc. 
So they walk up to uh, the Coast Guard uh, desk and, or table and they ask for applications. And the officer is handing um, my father's three Caucasian friends applications and ignoring my dad. And my dad said, well, I want an application too. And he said, well, what's your last name? And he said, Korematsu. Well, we can't give anyone who's Japanese um, an application. And, uh, and it's, it, it, he was just stunned. And so his three friends said, come on, Fred, let's, let's try the National Guard. So they went on to the National Guard. And of course, the tables were right next to each other. But this is a senior officer. So he's handing applications um, to his three friends and ignoring my dad. And my dad said, well, I want an application. And the officer, senior officer said, we have orders not to give anyone who is of Japanese ancestry an application. And my dad said, I'm an American. I want to serve my country. So how would you feel? It still pains me today that he upset him so much. So that's how much he believed in this country. And, Excuse me. Um, and so, you know, when, and, and then he worked in, and he wanted to continue with the war effort, so he worked in the shipyards. So the day after Pearl Harbor was, because Pearl Harbor was on a Sunday, all right, December 7th, 1941, we reported to work on a Monday, and there was a note in the time slot, and it said to report to the Union, and they fired him. They fired anyone who was of Japanese ancestry that worked for the military or the government or, or associated with, with either. And, and, and my father couldn't believe it. So he you know, tried to find some odd jobs and, and, uh, and he, was, he was a welder. And, uh, and then we have Executive Order 9066 that was issued. And, and you know, he, he, um, he, he, he didn't think it was right. I mean, why should he go to a prison camp when he had done nothing wrong? Um, and of course, there's, there's, there's always a love story, right? So the love story is he had a girlfriend. Uh, she was Italian-American, uh, uh, which, you know, the Italians were not getting along with the, with the Japanese at that time either. Uh, but uh, if my mother were here, we have two friends here from Honolulu that met my mother, uh, that, uh, you know, she would, she would say, well, um, she would have never deserted my father if it was her at that time. So uh, I always have to say that. And, uh, uh, but you know, he, he changed his name um, to a kind of a, supposedly a Spanish Hawaiian name that I had never even heard of. He doesn't even know where it came from. Made up name, uh, Clyde Sarah, which you may have read in a book. And, uh, and then also his girlfriend, because he, he, you, could go, uh, you, you could go to Nevada, but there was a window of time that, that they gave uh, people in, in, on the West Coast to leave. Um, but it was only like a week, it was a very short period of time. So uh, his girlfriend decided, um, that he, she read in the newspaper about a plastic surgeon. So, you know, I mean, you do anything for love, right? For your girlfriend. And uh, so he did, but it didn't, it didn't work because, you know, his mother recognized him. So it, it was, it was a, a, really a con, I think. Uh, if you if you want to know, but you know that's and and uh, and so that's how American is that right? That you want to stay you know in your community and be with your girlfriend and carry on with your life. Um, I'm sure you all can identify with that. So he um, he he uh, lived um, in a in housing area near Chinatown to kind of blend in. Uh, but on May 30th, um, he was uh, spotted on, we don't, don't even know how, on a, on a, on a uh, street corner in San Leandro. And they arrested him. And then he uh, was take, moved around from jail to jail. They, they didn't know what to do with him. Um, and he ended up in federal uh, jail in San Francisco. And one day, this attorney named Mr. Bessick, now he was the executive director of the Northern California affiliate of the ACLU visited my dad, and he, and he said, if he, he, he asked my dad if he'd be willing to be a test case. And, and, and my dad said yes, because Mr. Bessick said, if need be, we'll take this all the way to the Supreme Court. And my father thought for sure, by the time this case got to the Supreme Court, they would see it was unconstitutional. 
And uh, in, of, of course, you know, that, that wasn't the case. But then he was sent, after his bail hearing, he was actually sent over to a stockade in the San Francisco Presidio. Full circle, because that was the home at the time of the 4th Army, the Western Defense Command, right? They always, you know, military always had the best uh, real estate ever. And uh, next to the, the Golden Gate Bridge. And there was this General John DeWitt, who issued over 100 exclusion orders that forcibly removed Japanese Americans and, and people of Japanese ancestry from the West Coast. Hundred and now we know there's 125,000. There's been 5,000 more that have been discovered um, that were part of that um, uh, ex exclusion, and two thirds were American citizens. Remember that. And uh, and so he, you know he my father they sent him to my father to, to the stockade. We're still not sure where it is. But when I founded the um, the Fred Karmatsu Institute. And uh, I said, I want our office in the Presidio. And now we're going to build uh, a Fred Cormontz Interpretive Center for Social Justice. Um, we have some cards out there about a traveling exhibit that's going to go with it. And it'll be, because it's, it's, it's place-based, um, the history happened there. It's more than a museum. You know, you can have a Fred Cormontz Museum, you know, in Oklahoma. Um, or Austin, <laughs> which that's okay. Um, and uh, but this is where you know the history happened there, and we're also going to expand it to uh, more of an ethnic studies umbrella because we want to tie those stories together. You know, we're on indigenous land in San Francisco, the Alani. Um, you know, the I mean, we work with African Americans. I mean, my father met Rosa Parks, uh, which was that was iconic um, and, and incredible. Thanks to the ACLU. Uh, and uh, you know these stories that all tie together. So the the uh, the immigration story of you know the Mexican Americans, Mexicans that came into California for you know because that's that's what you know people want to do better, right? That's the immigration story. Even my grandparents uh, wanted to come to California because there was supposed to be all this opportunity. And um, you know so it, it it and then my father was sent over to. They made these detention assembly centers up and down the West Coast, which were really horse stalls. I mean, they were, they were racetracks. Tan Ferran Racetrack, which is near San Francisco Airport, now a um, shopping center. I mean, they, you know, they just took um, uh, horse stalls, whitewashed them. Um, there was still dirt on the floor. Uh, the light bulb overhead. We had an iron cot, an iron, you know, an army blanket, and that was it. You know, it still smelled like manure. I mean, we treat animals better than we treated the Japanese Americans. It, the story of the, the Japanese American incarceration, and even what's happening now down in Crystal City, um, all these issues overseas, and, and it, it, it's all inhumane. And we have to stand up for humanity. We have to stand up for human rights. Um, and, and that's, you know, what I also try to emphasize, because you know, we're, we're all human beings. We should be working together, not fighting against each other. And so when my father arrived at Tan Ferran, the, the men there in the Japanese American community decided to have a meeting um, underneath one of the, the bleachers of the racetrack to determine whether or not my father should carry on fighting his case. They didn't invite my dad to the meeting. And uh, his oldest brother, um, afterwards, you know, saw my dad, and, and my dad said, well, you know, what, what happened? And they said, Fred, we don't think that you should carry on fighting your case because you're going to make it bad for the rest of us. And my father didn't say anything. My father was a very quiet person, um, introverted, but he had conviction. He... He, you know, you, you could, if, even if you asked him what made him do what he did, he wouldn't be able to tell you. It was something that was just so deep inside of him. He, he just, just believed that this was wrong. And, um, and so uh, no one wanted anything to do with him. They ostracized him and vilified him. I mean, even his family, you know, he brought shame to the family. And for Asian American families, you know how that goes. You bring shame to the family, boy. You know, you have really done wrong. And uh, my grandmother cried, my grandfather was disgusted, his brothers didn't want anything to do with him, he had three brothers. 
So, it, and, and even when he was um, sent to Topaz, Utah, which is one of the 10 incarceration camps, which was desolate land, a lot of those were even indigenous land, um, you know, it was barracks with no air conditioning, no heating, it might have a pop belly uh, stove, food was awful, and, and, and that's how people had to live for three or four years. But, um, and again, no one wanted anything to do with my father. So it's, you know, this is, this is the story. And then I, um, uh, he met, he, the other part of the story is, you could go east before the end of the war, you know, because the government knew the Japanese or Americans were not dangerous. There was never any evidence of any spying or, or um, espionage on the west coast, period. And so by the time that, um, you know, my father's case went to the Supreme Court, uh, the, when we found out in 1983, when the evidence was discovered, was that the Department of Justice had lied to the Supreme Court, had altered evidence, and destroyed evidence. Think about that. Because what would have their decision been if they had all this actual evidence? We don't know. Um, and uh, so my father went to Detroit, Michigan, because my, my uncle was already there. And that's where he met um, my mother, who is Caucasian. So I'm, you know, I call myself Hapa because that's my identity. Um, you know, half Japanese American and half Caucasian. Uh, and because I always had an identity crisis as well, you know, until I went to Honolulu for the first time and felt like I fit in. You know, everybody else looked like me. So um, and my brother, who's Ken, who's four years younger, who actually has done all of our graphics and documentary and everything, is. You know, he had that same experience um, when he went to Honolulu, and, and, and uh, you know, I never even had told him what I had felt. So that's, it's interesting that we both felt the same way, that, you know, we go to Honolulu and, and we feel like, you know, we're, we're, we're going home, you know, we've come home. And, um, and even to this day, that's, I still feel that way. Um, but, so my mother was born in South Carolina, and, um, you know, they, because of the uh, the laws, uh, they they couldn't get married in uh, you know miscegenation uh, law, anti-miscegenation laws. They couldn't get married in South Carolina, and California had not changed their laws. So they were married in welcoming Midwest, Detroit, Michigan, and went out to you know California because my grandmother wasn't well. My grandmother Korematsu, and uh, my father was very close to his mother, and they decided to stay. So my brother and I grew up in the in the East Bay, and we, my, you know, because of of my father, you know, uh, as um, well being also Japanese American. I mean, you know, there was like red lining of housing. Um, he could never buy a house. He, when he did buy a house, it had to be through a third party. He had employment discrimination. Um, but I attended a high school uh, of 2,500 people of uh, kids, um, and there's only six Asian Americans in the class, and. Uh, the, um, in my social studies class, um, in, uh, when I was about 16 years old, the, um, uh, the teacher had assigned a paperback book for, um, of, different, of different subjects and stories to my classmates. There's 35 in my class. And we all had you know, something to, to read, and then we, you know, gave, uh, and then we gave the, uh, got up in front of the class to give the book report you know, back in those days. Uh, and but my friend Maya was Japanese American, and I known her since I was five years old. Her book was called Concentration Camps USA. Think about that title, Concentration Camps USA. Now it was my friend Maya, so I was paying attention. Um, and uh, and then she goes on to um, uh, describe this terrible time in history for Japanese Americans. And I, you know, didn't, I had never heard that before. And she goes on to explain that. And then she says there's this one man who disobeyed the military orders, and it ended up to be a landmark Supreme Court case, Korematsu versus the United States. Oh, <laughs> that's my last name. And I have 35 pairs of eyes turning around looking at me, and I'm shrugging my shoulders because 
I'm thinking that's some black sheep of the family. <laughs> my, my father's oldest brother didn't turn out to be such a shining light after all, so I thought it was him. <laughs> and then after class, I said to my friend Maya, what's this about? And she says, well, this is about your dad. I said, no way. I said, so what you have told me? And I go running home and confront my mother, and I get the standard answer, you know, back in those days was, <clears throat> you'll have to wait until your father gets home. Today. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, it was a long time between, you know, 3.30 and 8 o'clock at night because my father worked two jobs. And, uh, and so I, you know, confronted him and calmed down about that time. You know, my father was a very quiet person, very introverted, soft-spoken, um, you know, very kind and generous. Um, you know, it, 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 so I, you know, it was kind of very, very careful. And I, I, but I explained to him what I learned that day in school, because he, you know, me, my friend, my aunt, the Japanese American families knew each other. And, uh, and he simply said, it happened a long time ago. And what I did, he, he thought was right. What he did, he thought was right. And the government was wrong. It was that clear and simple. It wasn't complicated. And I could see this hurt going over his face. And it was like somebody sucked me in the stomach and I couldn't ask him any more questions. Except, I asked him if he could vote. And he said yes, because he had served his um, probation, right? And this is California, I mean, every state is different. So, um, and, uh, and so we didn't even talk about it again. Because I always thought, why am I become an attorney? I'm not an attorney. And it, it, it's it, until 1982, actually, when Professor Peter Irons um, visited my father, and he's the one, uh, along with um, Michael Hersip Yoshinaga, who was Japanese American, found the evidence in Washington, D.C. that proved that there was no military necessity. Um, until that time, I never knew that my father never gave up hope. Think about that. To have that inside of yourself for 40 years and he was never bitter or angry he never blamed anyone he just said the government was wrong and he was right and you know that's the type of person that he was and so when his conviction was overturned and vacated in 1983 november 10th 1983 we just had the 40th anniversary of the quorum novus cases um, uh, in october in san francisco Quorum nobis, for some of you who don't know law in Latin, means an error is made before us. An error has been made before the court. And because he had served his sentence along with Gordon Yavash and Enyasui, those ten cases had to do with the curfew, that they were able to reopen my father's case. Um, and, and, and the attorneys, for all of you who are here at law school, all the attorneys work pro bono. Right? They, they worked for nothing. They raised money, they worked at night, they worked on the weekends and they had to work in secret because they didn't want the government to know what kind of, of papers they had. Um, and so they would, you know, call up people and say, <clears throat> we're, we're working on this um, really significant ca uh, case for the Japanese American community and we're trying to raise money. But we can't tell you what it's about, you know. And, but they were successful. And so, you know, for my two board members here, Jesse from Seattle and Andy Liu from here from Austin, that, that's really a, a great trick I'm trying to use all the time, you know, to raise money. I can't tell you about it, but we need money. Um, <laughs> uh, but, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it was just a, a, amazing. And, uh, and because he was so, my phone was so quiet that, uh, and shy, um, he wasn't a public speaker. But they, everyone kept encouraging. They invited him, and he always showed up. My parents always showed up for everything they invited to, even in Honolulu. And, uh, and, and so, you know, they would stick a microphone kind of in his face, and, and you know, people, the news people would ask him questions. And he realized it was so important to not only share his story, but to tell the story of the Japanese American incarceration. And that's why he crisscrossed this country until five months before he passed away. He received the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 1998 for President Clinton. And then five months before he passed away, he gave me the charge to carry on with education and telling him so his story. And I said, I am not an attorney. I am not a public speaker. How the heck am I going to do this? But I found a way. 
Um, and, you know, to this day, I don't take no for an answer. Like my father took no for an, you know, he didn't take no for an answer. And I just keep pushing. That's why we're doing, you know, Fred Cuomo today of civil liberties in the Constitution, even in Austin, Texas. Um, but we do curriculum and education K through 12. Um, and, and emphasizing, you know, as we talked about, ethnic studies, because we want to not only tell the AAPI story, but also tell all those stories together. Um, so, you know, if my, if, you know it, my father was one man in the face of adversity that can make a difference, and so can you. And remember my father's words. Stand up for what is right, and don't be afraid to speak up. Thank you. I think in that conversation, you, you pretty much hit upon every single question. <laughs> What I don't think a lot of uh, folks in this room may be aware of, and maybe you could kind of shed a little bit more uh, light for them, is there was also, you know, people like to think that it was the bombing of Pearl Harbor that really just, you know, that was kind of the, the, the causation for uh, incarceration. But in reality, there were a lot of other factors too, and, you know, going even past from, you know, the, a lot of the anti-Asian sentiments before that, there was a lot of economic factors that people aren't aware of because of the number of Japanese that were in sense recruited to come to the United States for farming. Do you think you could maybe share with the audience a little bit of that? Um, yes, I mean, that's what we do in this country. You know, even starting with the, with the Chinese that we brought over to build the railroads. I mean, it, it's like, you know, come to, to come to America, land of opportunity, and then we'll treat you like a slave and give you a little money and then marginalize you. I mean, it, it's, it was, you know, same for the, 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 um, the Japanese, like my, my grandfather. Um, the, uh, the, our government went into the five prefectures, um, meaning counties of uh, Japan that were heavily agricultural, and recruited people like my grandfather, um, and, you know, and, and to work, um, especially in, um, and he ended up in California, but first they sent him to Hawaii to work in the sugarcane fields in, um, actually on Kauai, which, you know, that was another kind of slave labor camp, really. Um, but made his way to San Francisco and was in agriculture. And so it was a California um, uh, Farmers Association um, made up a lot of uh, Caucasian men who, um, who really were very disgruntled because the Japanese were very good farmers. They knew how to take land that was really not, you know, to anyone else was not really, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know, viable, and, and they didn't think they could grow anything on it. But the Japanese uh, farmers could, and so this, you know, California Farmers Association um, was very jealous, and they were uh, really kind of, uh, you know, underhandedly campaigning to get rid of the Japanese. They wrote a, I found a letter that was written actually to uh, then a, a California Attorney General uh, um, Earl Warren, who later, you know, found his social justice con conscience, conscience when he became, you know, Supreme Court Justice. But back in California, he did not. And he upheld uh, the Japanese American incarceration. And so that was really the backstory. It's always land. And, you know, the, the alien land law that it, you and now is current that we're, we're all hearing about again, you know, California, um, you know, after um, October um, uh, 13, 1913, if you were an immigrant, you couldn't buy land. And that's why a lot of the, uh, the Japanese immigrants who wanted to become Americans, and that law didn't change until 1952, um, you know, tried to transfer their property to their sons um, or daughters because that was a way of holding on to the land. So, you know, land is, is and property is, is very important, and, and, the, and the Japanese community was very proud. Um, and uh, it was a sh it was it was really shameful that the way that they um, you know that they were treated and also they these these other the farmers association was also lobbying to uh, because the the farm equipment was put in a lot of it was you know warehoused right and so they wanted that that farm machinery like you know um, far, uh, farm machine machines agriculture machines you know like for nothing and they were trying to really take those as well. So this is, and we continue now, even with the, 
Um, the Latinos have come up to work in, you know, in California and now in agriculture. I mean, it's been the same old story. So, you know, when are we going to stop this? That's, this is, these are the lessons that we need to learn. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Korematsu. I, I think I have to open it up to the audience right now for questions. So, are there any modern day human rights issues in the U.S. that you see about, that you see as similarly vital to speak up about, but perhaps unpopular to do so? Well, take your pick. <laughs> um, <laughs> Really? Um, you know, I mean, I think that the, you know, the immigration issues are just still, uh, uh, you know, outrageous. I mean, it, it's in the way that we're, you know, treating, I mean, even, as, you know, the asylum, um, that, that, you know, issues as well. I mean, that's really part of the immigration story. So, we, you know, we haven't learned the lessons of, of immigration. And we, you know, our immigration issues are a mess. So if you want something to work on, boy, you know, they need help. And then I, I think another question they had, Dr. Korematsu, was whether you saw a connection, or can you kind of describe the connection between the Supreme Court refusing to strike down Japanese incarceration and our current immigration law landscape? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, I think, quite, you know, evident. I mean, the way the Supreme Court is now, um, you know, even, and, and to further that is even our abortion rights, you know, that, that have been violated. Um, I, you know, I, I will, um, I, I don't want to kind of politic well, everything has been politicized, but I, I am, you know, we're a nonpartisan organization, but hey, I'm a woman, and this is my body, and I want control over it. No one is going to tell me what to do about my own body, and that's what we all need to, you know, fight for. And even, you know, we need the, the men to help us too, because these are other issues that we need to fight against. Um, you know, th this is. You know, the, the marginalization and discrimination, it comes in, in many different forms. And, uh, and, and we all need to still, you know, speak out and work together to fight against it. That's the only way that we're going to make change. It's not going to happen by itself. Can you actually describe maybe what's happening in Crystal City? For those that are aware, um, yeah, Crystal City was actually um, a, a, a Department of, of Justice camp back during the incarceration, um, and um, part of the Crystal City story was, um, you know, the uh, the government, the military, uh, really wanted to find kind of a disposable uh, people that they could trade, um, you know, for um, you know uh, that uh, for the soldiers that maybe had been captured. Um, and so they they um, they worked with the governments and you know like especially in Peru um, and the Japanese were really taken from their homes their their, their possessions were also taken uh, the government sold their possessions and they were brought to um, the U S especially to Crystal City and incarcerated there so uh, they weren't one of the ten incarceration camps because it was a Department of Justice camp. And, uh, and now they're using Crystal City for the um, immigrants and, uh, and the asylum that um, people that are, you know, are people that are speaking, seeking asylum and putting them there in Crystal City, amongst other places. Also, the one thing I am against is separation of families. I mean, really. You know, they did this in, in uh, the day after Pearl Harbor. Um, a lot of the community uh, members, Japanese community members, were taken away from their homes. Their, their, they, you know, the, their families didn't know where they, where they were sent. Um, children are also separated, um, and, and now we're doing that again. I mean, we just don't seem to learn that this is inhumane, and that's something that we need to, to speak up against. What do, you, what do you think being American means for Asian Americans in the modern day today? Because when I ask this question about, I ask pretty much all my students in every class I teach, are you proud to be an American? And the number of hands right now is, is not very high. And maybe you could shed a little bit of your insight on that. Well, I am proud to be an American because I, because of my father, we have the opportunity to make change. We just need to work together to do it. Yes, you know, I keep, you know, I, I growing up, and uh, you know, even in the east, in the East Bay, in you know, around the time of Pearl Harbor. My elementary school teacher would show up the picture of bombing of Pearl Harbor 
and just say the Japanese were very bad people and they were, they came over to, they was, were, went over to Hawaii, bombed Pearl Harbor, and killed over 2,000, you know, uh, um, American servicemen. And, you know, you know, the Japanese people are really bad. Well, hello, you know, what do you think the kids did? I mean, I, I was bullied, I, I, you know, had racist remarks, they would, they would swear at me, it was to the point where I couldn't even ride the school bus. I had to make up stories to my mother, at least she had a car, of, you know, well, I'm not feeling very good, Mom, you know, today, would you take me to school? But I never told my parents. And my brother had the same experience, he never told my parents. And so this happened all the way through high school. And even, you know, even along the way, and, uh, and I, I, um, had a, I worked in business, you know, before I started the Korematsu Institute, and I certainly was always hit, hitting the bamboo ceiling um, and being marginalized. You know, we're, not, the, we're still looking at Asian Americans here in this country as perpetual foreigners. I get that. That's why, I, why I, it gets me up in the morning to, to try to make this change. The way we, I'm trying to make changes to teach these young people, you know, the K through 12 kids, because I mean, a lot of adults have already made up their minds. But, you know, I, I say if someone says something, speak up. You know, hey, you're, this is not right. You can't, you know, you can't say these things. It's wrong. You're insulting. And, you know, this is, this is part of, you know, the belonging issue. We all belong here. And we all have to fight against this. And you have to speak up when someone is going to say a racist remark or say, you know, they, I mean, I just love this one. Uh, where did you come from? Well, I was born in Oakland. No, where did you really come from? You know, really? And uh, it, it's, you know, I even, you know, with my last name, Korematsu, well, how do you spell that? Um, I, I spelled it, well, what kind of name is that? Well, it's Japanese. Oh, well, you, you speak good English for someone who is Japanese. I said, I'm not, I'm an American. So it, it, it's a constant battle, and, and I'm probably gonna have to fight this the rest of my life, because, you know, I have a lot of people saying no to me. And of, of course, for Asian Americans, I mean, they just, they, you know, because of this model minority myth, actually, if you don't know this, this was, re this was a result of a professor, sociology professor um, at UC Berkeley that created this, this model minority that, oh, the Japanese families have done very well, they've assimilated, you know, the kids are going to school, their businesses are coming back, you know, and, and, and then they try to use it against um, students, you know, because there's too many Asian Americans trying to um, uh, let's say go to UC Berkeley or you know wherever they're trying to apply to school, and um, you know, it, and then they try to pin African Americans against Asian Americans. You know, it just goes on and on and on, and and we just have to keep fighting, but but also to correct, correct the you know the information out there. There's so many so much misinformation and disinformation, and that's what worries me the most. Another question I had was, um, this also came from a student, but I had this as well. You know, Trump v. Hawaii in 2018 was the Supreme Court ruled on. And of course, some people hail that decision as it overruled Korematsu. And yet, you also have legal scholars who say that it was just a uh, dictum, right? Yeah. Can you mind sharing some yeah. of your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it actually, um, you know, it was, uh, I was speaking at a Nepal conference, a National Asian Pacific American Bar Association conference, and I, you know, tell the story of my father all the time and say, you know, what person can make a difference and so can you. So actually, it was the Attorney General of Hawaii at that time who decided to have this lawsuit against, um, uh, against Trump because of the Muslim um, travel ban, because of the executive order that he had issued um, on January 27, 2017. And, uh, and then, of course, then uh, there was pushback. So then it was changed to uh, the uh, immigration ban. Well, then, of course, there was pushback on that. And then uh, they decided to include Venezuela and, and call it the travel ban. Big deal. I mean, it is what it is. And that's what, we, what the government tries to do, is you know, to, trade, to, to, to change these euphemisms. And so it, it, it was actually um, my father's legal team <clears throat> that's become like my family. And, uh, and I said, you know, we need to do something about this. And, and so we decided to go ahead and submit an advocacy brief, you know, as a Friends of the Court brief. And I said, to make this strong, you know, we need to do two things. To tell the Supreme Court the dangers of overreaching of power, 
because that was quite obvious. And two, to remind them of my father's Supreme Court case, because it's really the major case, you know, above here by Ashi and Men Yasui. However, um, the, their children, um, Holly Yasui and Jay Hirbashi, you know, we've always been working together ever since our father's convictions were, were vacated, and, and we submitted this amicus brief, you know, together. And, and so, you know, we knew it was going to be a struggle. Um, but, um, I mean, it, it, uh, it was totally disappointing. I mean, of course it wasn't unanimous. Um, I think it was a five to four decision. And if you ever want to read a great dissenting opinion, read Justice Sotomayor's opinion. And um, I've, I've met her since then, which is, was incredible. Um, but she went for the juggler. And, and told it like it was, and said this is wrong, and that we also need to, you know, to, to overturn Corbin versus United States. So, you know, Justice Roberts, you know, kind of in this decision, um, you know, casually says that, uh, you know, it's been um, overruled in the court of, of history. Big deal. <laughs> and, um, you know, and like you said, it's, you know, it's dictum, and, and, uh, and uh, it, it was only because Justice Sotomayor went after him. And, uh, and whether or not it could be really used as another precedent would take another Supreme Court case. Um, but, you know, stay tuned because look at this country. And we don't know what's going to be coming. Um, that's why it's so important to vote, to register to vote. Even if you don't agree with one side or the other, your vote is power. Uh, that is why I, I, I think it's, it's, it's important to remember that and to be part of that change. You know, we, if we don't all vote, we're never going to get anywhere. And, and we have that power. I've traveled around the world where people would just give their IT to be able to vote and vote without restrictions or vote, you know, you know and not have the, the, I mean, even we, we have these voting, voting rights issues now. I mean, don't, don't you know, I'm not going to kid you. But it is, it's important that you all register to vote and vote, you know, because also it's about the issues and the policy. You know, it, it, it's not just all, always the candidate and how we want to make change. So um, it, it, it's, it's, that's where we, you know, that's why I keep doing this. I've done several with the amicus briefs. Um, you know, it was my father actually, I want to remind everyone that the day after 9-11, um, when, um, when a General, a Attorney General Ashcroft uh, cited my father as uh, a court case as a reason to possibly round up Arab and Muslim Americans. Um, you know, my father spoke up and said, "You know, government, you did this before. You can't do this again." So, you know, we need to remind the. You know, that's why I do this. I mean, I I don't do this obviously for my health. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, but I have to keep going because I feel respons a responsibility. You know, I'm Fred Cormansu's daughter. And I feel a responsibility to be his voice, um, his living voice, to, to try to right these wrongs. I think I just have time for maybe one more question. I think this is a... Does anybody have a question here? I'm reading questions from the audience. Oh, they're, they're, they're texting it to me. oh okay. <laughs> that technology, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not up with it. I wasn't being familiar, I promise. <laughs> Can you perhaps speak to the alignment of some Asian Americans with the decline of civil rights, such as affirmative action, and what it means to be Asian American and work in coalition with other ethnic identities? Yeah, the coalition is very important because, um, I mean, that's why actually, um, you know, the, um, what a lot of Japanese Americans are, even my, one of my father's um, legal team members in California has been on a commission to, um, to, uh, to help write a report about reparations for the African Americans in California. Um, we have HR 40 that's out there that I really believe that we need to have a redress and reparations for African Americans. Uh, it, it's about time. If we don't, you know, the, the, and with, you know, with the Japanese Americans, and we, you know, we fought for that, we had a, a lot of compromise. Believe you me, this was not a, a cakewalk. And, and of course, what was difficult was you know, people that, that passed away, like my grandparents, you know, they didn't receive anything. And there was, and you can't, the money, there was, you know, they wouldn't allow the money to go to the families. You know, we're trying to make that change for the African Americans that were enslaved. Uh, because if we, you know, we, we have this generational, um, uh, you know, hurt and, and pain. And we have to stop this. 
Um, and we need to recognize and the wrongs that, that this country has made. You know, if we don't, if we, if, the, if America doesn't, isn't accountable for their mistakes, then how can we make change? And that's why it's important to, um, to support each other, to support, you know, these affiliations, um, and, uh, and, and, to, and to work to, to try to get to a better place. I mean, we have, you know, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and, and we need that. That's at least something that's been recent. But, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not going, looking at this through rose-colored glasses either, because, you know, we realize what's going on, and we just have to keep, you know, pushing um, if we're, you know, if we are going to make that change and, and to make it so that, you know, it's, it, I'm hoping your, your generation can, can make that difference. You're young enough that you can, you know, keep fighting and, and participate. Because, you know, my father always showed up. He, he put his name out there. He could have, you know, I mean, he still got criticized, believe you me. Um, but he just let it go. You know, we just can't internalize it. We just have to let it go and say, well, you know, that's your opinion, but I don't agree. And just keep fighting together. Find those allies. Work in solidarity. We have that luxury now. In 1942, there were not the organizations that supported the Japanese Americans. I mean, even the National ACLU did not. It was only the Northern California affiliate. And Mr. Bessick, who was the attorney there, um, was threatened with ouster from the National ACLU. You know, those are the heroes that, that, that have helped along the way. And there's more out there. So this is what my father's, you know, day represents and the civil liberties of our Constitution. And keep fighting for our democracy. It's important and it's fragile. And if we don't, we're going to lose a lot. And, and, and if we do, it's going to be too late. So I'm putting all that charge to all of you. Because you can make that difference. It looks like we are out of time, unfortunately, because I would probably talk to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, again, I just want to you know, thank you for, for sharing your time with us and this space with me. I mean, I've had chills this whole time, and I really appreciate this. This might be the highlight of my legal career. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, your father is a better man than me because when I teach it, like I get so upset about about you know what Fahey did, the Solicitor General yeah. violating 3.3, right. which they emphasize over and over, you know, in professional responsibility, and, and it's something that you know when you take that oath, and you hold it very deeply. So right. please give your you know a very warm welcome or applause for appreciation for Dr. Korematsu and for. for